Hi, I'm Dr. Vance Traylon. I'm the Medical Director for Riverside County EMS Agency. And today I want to introduce to you the uh, TXA study we're doing with trauma. Uh, we're collaborating with ISIMA on this study. They're the lead agency and then we're uh, coming in to participate and work with them on it. And TXA is a, a drug to help with uh, clotting problems and trauma. Um, but first I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing overall in our county. Uh, to improve care, you want to do better, evaluate, learn what's, what we can do in the field better. That's going to take feedback from everybody in the field. Anytime we do something, we need feedback of what the problem was, how to improve it, how to make it better. Now, once we've done that, we still need a, an outside group to review what we do. And in science, that's called a peer review system. We may end up publishing things in the literature. That is a type of research. Another type of research people talk about is where you, you experiment on somebody. Um, but this is a type of research where we're going to uh, identify what we do, get feedback from the field, from you in the field, medics, nurses, um, did this work, how can we make it better, and continue the cycle. To some degree, it's like taking our CQI and turning it into research. So that's what we want to be doing. Now, there's many aspects of any study we do. Uh, one of them is, can something that's done in the hospital be done in the environment where the paramedic works? Uh, Remember, the environment you work has got a lot more hazards and difficulties than in a well-controlled environment in the hospital. So we're taking a well-studied drug, medication, taking it to the field with a little bit less control, uh, more difficult to evaluate the patient, more difficult to administer. And we want to know from you, does this work? You'll be uh, preparing a medication, infusing it over 10 minutes, keeping the patient warm so it doesn't affect the performance of the drug. And we want you to tell us, did this work? We're going to be looking at the patients. Did we miss some of the patients? Did we give it to too many? Did we got, not give it to enough patients? Um, how you evaluate the patient has to be clearly described. What you do has to be clearly described. And any problems you have must be communicated to us so we can improve the program. Uh, how we start may not be how we end. If you start telling us there's a problem in the field, we need to adjust the study to improve the work. That's a very important aspect. The other aspect of the study is, what you did in the field, does that affect outcome such as mortality rate or morbidity? Did they die uh, day one or day two? Did we change that, that death rate? So we want to connect what you did in the field with the death of the patient or survival of the patient. What you did in the field has to be continually improved as we identify problems in the field. Now this is going to be the first of, of a number of, of studies, you might call it, of, of how we can improve care in the field. Some will be with medications, some will be with the way we think, some will be with procedures in the field. But I want you to be thinking in terms of, of we at Riverside EMS Agency and we in Riverside County are, have a goal now of, of influencing care regionally, locally, even the state, and even in the country. How can we improve care? How can we take what we've learned in the field, our experience, study it, and improve? Now, we're going to have a policy at RIMSA for this to review, and you want to go back to that uh, to refresh your memory whenever necessary. Uh, for operational purposes, we're going to cover the whole county, and the helicopters can cross county lines with the patients, so don't worry about that. That's not an issue. Um, it be all the trauma patients that meet the criteria they treat, and when you do treat somebody, put a the bright green or neon fluorescent, whatever color you, green it is, that very bright thing that people can catch easily. Put that green armband on the patient so we know where, where it's going. Now we're going to have about 18 months to do the study, or 225 patients, whichever comes first. Uh, one of the reasons we do a, a limit on, on length of study is because uh, uh, information and, and the way we do things changes, and the number 225 is set to give us a statistical analysis of whether we can measure a difference or not. Uh, we will be uh, uh, using 50 milliliter bags. It's simply the nature of our county, the, the bags available that we use. Um, the main thing is not so much the size of the bag, uh, but that it has to go in over at least 10 minutes. Uh, we don't want to drop the blood pressure and keep the patient warm, obviously, too, because there's some changes we'll talk about in a minute. And those agencies that, that can participate have to be able to have the electronic record. Now, the agencies that will be participating in this uh, study, in fact, uh, any study we do, the agencies that will participate, will be those that use an electronic record. It's a simple matter that uh, we need to have access to the numbers, the data that you collect, the descriptions you make. Descriptions are incredibly important to be objective, articulate so they make sense to somebody else, and then we can lift that information out and use that for feedback and to better improve the program. Um, so if you're not using an electronic record, uh, we appreciate your support. Now, when we're bleeding, 
we have the venous bleeding and arterial bleeding, but let's talk about arterial bleeding right now. Arterial bleeding stops with the release of, of products that, fibrin is one of them, that, that traps the red cells and forms a clot. That's what we see. You've heard a bit about um, permissive hypotension where if the blood pressure gets too high, it breaks a clot loose, and that, that is a problem. So the clots form and they harden over time. But our bodies have a system that we can't keep forming clots every time we have a break in the surface and then the fibrin comes out and creates a clot. This is called fibrinolysis, lysis being it breaks it apart. So we have chemicals in our body that, that identify clot areas that shouldn't be there and remove those clots. Um, sometimes you'll see like in the heart or the brain, a clot will form and then um, it recanalizes. Re there's, there's a blood will flow back through it. Well, that's because this um, uh, plasmin has dissolved the clot so we can have good flow. Um, now our body doesn't carry plasmin around. Uh, it has to carry some kind of a precursor type that can be turned on appropriately. So plasminogen, the gen, G-E-N, means it's the starter of plasmin. So plasminogen gets triggered into creating plasmin, which can dissolve a clot. And that's a good thing sometimes, sometimes it's a bad thing. Well, in our bodies then, if the plasminogen gets activated to make plasmin, the plasmin then uh, lyses the clot. We don't want that. TXA is a molecule that will block the plasminogen going into plasmin. So it keeps the plasminogen contained in itself and not changing. Now let's put this in practical terms. Your patient in the field, you responded, trauma, they're bleeding, the clot is forming, and that's containing the bleeding, it's stopping the bleeding. But something happened inside the body that thinks that, well, this clot has to be dissolved, so the plasmin is released, is produced, and the plasmin now dissolves the clot. So on the one hand, we have a clotting cascade, which we want, and we have this other counter section that um, is, is dissolving the clot. So how do we, what do we do? Well, we can block that plasmin. How do we do that? The plasminogen is out there and is safe, as long as it's contained as plasminogen. The minute there's a cleavage occurring and the plasmin is released, we have this uh, uh, bleeding problem. So TXA is a molecule that will block that, but we have to give it to them in the proper time, which we wanted to study to find out when that time is. Now I want you to understand something behind the, the science behind this. We're moving towards a knowledge-based program and not rule-based. We're actually going to build on the rules, so we're not replacing the rules. We're going to build on that. So the rules here are when to give the TXA and what to watch for. The knowledge behind that is that they will tell you that TXA is a lysine-derived molecule. Well, lysine is an amino acid. That means that on one end of a short carbon chain is going to be a, an amino group, an ammonia group, and a, an acid group. Well, this is a long chain, so what happens is that they can loop it into a circle. Uh, it's called a, a ring, a, a six-carbon ring. And when they do that, they still have one end of it's got an acid group, and the other end has an, an amino acid group, an ammonia group. Now, that makes your TXA, but what really is different is if you lay it out flat, you'll see that the acid group can go up and the ammonia group can go up on either end, making a basket. Or the acid group can stay up, and on the other side of the flat molecule, the ammonia group goes downward. And now you have kind of a, a, a slide, flat, slide down, and that's called a trans. The first one's called cis, where they're both on the same side of the flat ring. Tran is on the opposite sides. That's where the tran exemic acid comes from. The trans simply tells you that. And why is that important? Because molecules have a three-dimensional structure. That three-dimensional structure can change. It can change with the tran form of having the two addition things on opposite sides. It can change with heat. For example, uh, I take an egg and it's all runny. I put it into a frying pan, heat it up, and that's a conformation change. It actually makes the proteins change their shape irreversibly. It becomes hard. Now we have a fried egg. If you'll notice, there's nothing you can do to make the egg liquid again. And so you can see that pH changes things like uh, fish. I can cook fish with heat, which changes a, a, the proteins and shrinks them down, or I can add acid, which does the same thing through vinegar, and that's what ceviche is. Well, when we put TXA into somebody, the same thing can happen. And so if the temperature gets too cold in the body, that'll change the conformation and make it less effective. So when you have somebody in trauma 
who you've given TXA to, please make sure that we don't lose heat. Um, the wind can blow across, wet clothing, evaporative water loss. Um, they can radiate heat out to uh, the sky, obviously. Um, keeping in mind that on a cloudy day, it's not so bad. On a clear day, it can be worse. So keep the person warm. Not so necessary to warm them up as it is to keep them from losing heat. And um, the other one is that because it's an amino acid, it can mimic some of the other molecules. And in this case, it can. So if you give the medication too fast, less than 10 minutes for our dosing, it'll actually drop the blood pressure. We don't exactly know how, probably something related to the vasodilation, but we don't know exactly how it does it. But pushing it in too fast can cause the, the uh, drop in blood pressure. So some places will use 100 cc's of water to dilute it over a period of 10 minutes. We're gonna be using 50. It's not so much what the volume is. The plain fact is it went longer than 10 minutes. 20 minutes is not so bad, but at least don't make it show shorter than 10 minutes. So this is a little bit about uh, the approach I want you to be thinking of is what's physically is happening? What's the science behind what we're doing here? I want to make it straightforward to you and whatever we do now in the county, I'd like to be having this discussion. Good day, my name is uh, Dr. Niki. I'm one of the principal investigators in this study. I'm going to talk about the TXA, the medication, and also the study design. TXA is well known from 1960s. This is an agent that actually um, maintains hemostasis when there is a fibrinolysis uh, in process causing a hemorrhagic uh, shock uh, to the patients. It has been used in various uh, studies in the past uh, um, and it is well known FDA approved for many procedures uh, that is um, uh, performed in hospital. Uh, these are lysine analogs families. Uh, from these medications, there are three medications um, that two of, us, uh, two of those are listed here. The amino caproic acid, which is currently used in ICU. Many of you are familiar with that for in-hospital use. And tranexamic acid or TXA, which is our study drug. One thing that we want to emphasize is that uh, TXA is not a uh, clotting factor. So if you're looking at a cl clotting fast, uh, pathway uh, or cascade, there is an intrinsic and extrinsic pathway and not, TXA is not involved in those uh, pathways. TXA is actually at the last step of cl uh, clotting cascade um, and is being used more like a cofactor that inhibits the enzymes. So in the diagram that you're looking at it right now, it is showing uh, the natural process of uh, uh, prevention of bleeding or hemorrhagic shock in the patients who are injured attraction of clotting factors to the uh, intrinsic or ex extrinsic uh, pathway, and then at the end, how the fibrin is so important in a pathway of uh, uh, clot formations and its stabilization. In a coagulation phase, you look at extrinsic, intrinsic, and common pathway, and at the end, on the right side, you see a page, uh, pictures of fibrin uh, mesh that is uh, in, in, uh, holds together the uh, platelet to form that uh, initial phase of coagulation or clot formations. Its mechanism of action, it inhibits both plasminogen activations and a plasmin activity. These are very essential to hold back the breakdown of uh, fibrin, which is essential in the bleeding, fact, uh, bleeding process. Uh, it is actually shown that it's 10 times more potent than amino caproic acid that is being used in ICU, and that was in vitro studies in the past. In the current diagram, you will look at exactly where the TXA is for, uh, uh, functioning. It's plasminogen uh, uh, at attachment site, and then it prevents the plasmin to break down the fibrin into the fibrin degradation products. So therefore, it stabilizes that fibrin mesh, and uh, you're looking at a nice picture there, uh, which shows fibrin uh, holding the platelets together and forming that initial clot formation. In the next slide, you'll see tranexamic acid, in other words, TXA, the attachment site on a plasminogen, which is basically the um, acting cofactors to work on a fibrin. What is noticeable here, you also see a TPA, uh, which is used also in a stroke patients, and it works also on the same molecule to break down the fibrin um, uh, uh, mesh and therefore helping actually people to break down their clot in those process. So um, 
not much known about the effect of uh, TXA on the TPA um, and I haven't discovered any studies in that regard. Uh, in the next picture you will see or diagram you will see a intact fibrin clot on the left side and then fibrin clot exposed to plasmin which is you're looking at those hole that is initiated and it prevents that formation of the clot and that's what we're trying to prevent by using of TXA in a hemorrhagic shock in a trauma patient. Uh, let me talk about the pharmacokinetic of this uh, medication. It actually being absorbed um, and onset of action is only about 5 to 15 minutes uh, whether you um, distribute it through the IV administration or IO as far as we know. Duration uh, of action is about three hours. Um, distribution is uh, protein binding, so um, so majority of this TXA is actually bound to the molecule that we want, which is plasminogen uh, in this case. Uh, and it passes through the blood brain barrier and placenta. So it shows that it actually can be used in traumatic head injury or in pregnant uh, uh, patients. Uh, so there are scenarios, that are argument out there whether you could use it in either cases, but the actual pharmacokinetic of this medication shows that it is actually usable in both cases. So how is it metabolized? A small fraction of this drug is being metabolized, less than 5%. So that gives us the uh, longevity of uh, being the TXA being in the uh, process of working uh, the way that we want it in, in the body. The half-life of this medication is anywhere between 2 to 11 hours. That's depending on renal failure, renal clearance, the amount of protein that is available in the body. That is very important. That's one of the things that we are trying to address in this study. Whether you need the only first dose or it does need those patients with hemorrhagic shock uh, may need a multiple. If a drug works between 3 to 11 hours with a half-life su such so variable, we may show in this study that uh, we may only need one dose of this uh, medication. That's why we are, it's very important for us that you uh, record properly uh, about all these TXA use and we follow on that um, uh, carefully to, look, to, to extract those data uh, in this scenario. And extraction, more than 95% of this uh, drug is unchanged uh, and comes out uh, through the urine um, and that's how it's extracting. What is the side effect of this medication? Well, there is a wide variety of side effects and it really depends on the dosage that you use. Um, the most common ones, acute gastrointestinal disturbances like nausea, vomiting, um, and, it's, and to some degree diarrhea. It is, it's been shown that in a low doses that we use here, uh, it's not showing as much those side effects. Visual disturbances like blurry vision, changes in color perceptions, these are only for people that actually have a genetic predisposition to this uh, side effect, um, especially with the prolonged use, uh, which they use it in a cardiovascular uh, surgeries or post-cardiovascular surgeries. Uh, DVTs and PE. In thromboembolic events, it, in a prior study, it showed that it didn't make any difference between using a, a TXA group or, or a control group uh, regarding this side effects. Some patients have complained about dizziness and fatigue, mild headache, um, hypersensitivity reaction is there, it has been noted, but it, again, you have to have a genetic predisposition to this problem uh, to, to show something like that, and you wouldn't know it prior to administration of first dose of TXA. Seizure, seizure only has been seen if you're using more than 10 grams. We are only limited to two grams in these studies, so we, there is no documented seizure in any of the studies that I've used less than the uh, um, cardiovascular protocol, which is 10 gram. Well, what are the contraindications? The absolute contraindication is if you have acquired defective color vision. You should know that from the patient's history. I know it will be hard to pick up those things, but these are why we have to be careful when we are administering this medication. Active intravascular clotting. These are the people that have already been diagnosed with PE and DVT. We just don't want to increase the chances that they may have had uh, other complications from use of TXA. However, um, all DVTs and PEs, again, uh, have established clot. There is no study that shows that TXA is going to make it worse. We are being cautious in this scenario. We want you to actually consider that as a contraindication. 
Hypersensitivity to TXA is a scenario where you administer the first dose and you see allergic reaction. So we'll stop using the second dose on this patient or if this patient by any chance had prior TXA as a uh, treatment protocol or modalities in the past, uh, we, we know from their history. And then the non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. In some studies show that it actually decreases blood flow and causes ischemic plumbra. In other words, makes the stroke worse in these people. Therefore, in this study, we want to avoid if it is subarachnoid hemorrhage that is happening spontaneously. However, there is a current trial by CRASH-3 and other um, institutions that are doing for traumatic head injury, and we are including those in, um, and we will follow those patients in our study. What is interesting is actually it also approved by Jehovah Witness, um, and there's a list of medication that is being approved by um, uh, their leadership, and you can look at it, Transic, uh, TXA is one of those medication um, along with uh, amino caproic acid uh, in this case, and a protein which is the third uh, lysing analog that has been um, actually out by FDA since 2004 in the United States. At this point, I want to take a little time about talking about this research uh, project and research protocol. Obviously, multi-institution and multi-agency, and it's really nice to know that so many agencies are actually uh, express interest to participate in this study. It took us a long time to come to this point to get the approval from various uh, agencies and political players in this game. But we are here. And what is the objective of this study? Uh, this is the first study that actually includes pre-hospital and in-hospital uh, treatment of TXA for patients. It is to determine if the pre-hospital administration of TXA in traumatic patients with signs of hemorrhagic shock provides for a statistically significant decrease in mortality, total blood product usage, and total estimated blood loss uh, without significant increase in thromboembolic component or side effects. Um, this is carefully designed to include both pre-hospital and in-hospital to compare simultaneously using the standard of uh, emergency medical services in North America. So how the study is being designed, uh, how we designed this study is that it is prospective observational and retrospective comparison. The reason is that we have four different groups here. We have paramedic group, we have aeromedical group, we have in-hospital group, and then we have a control group. So as a result, to have a statistically significant um, uh, and value our research, we need minimum of, minimum of 200 patients in each group. That doesn't mean that 200 is a limit. I'm hoping that with multiple agencies that are involved in this scenario, we will get more than that so it values our research in a better uh, sense and it shows any um, illusions or side effects that may have missed in a prior trial. As I mentioned, it's a multi-agency with the ISEMA and, um, and regional cooperation. Um, we are currently two trauma centers and multiple agencies, multiple air medical services that are involved. And geographic advantage that we have in San Bernardino County as being the largest county in, in the United States will allow us to uh, experiment in that regard. We follow the CRASH-2 protocol um, regarding the safety and uses of the medications and what to follow up. We wanted to see if we can replicate that study and the results with a little bit of a twist and more uh, in uh, detail with the standard of uh, emergency medical services in North America. Again, you have, I have to emphasize this because this is the first time that we are trying to connect the EMS agencies or outside or pre-hospital setting with the hospital with this standard that is follow being followed up in the United States and North America. The outcome, we look at the outcome as crash to mortality, blood loss, use of blood product, but also uh, the fluid use prior to administration of TXA and also head injuries that we are following up on those. So again, emphasizing the outcome measurement, survival, cause of death, mechanism of injuries, area of injury, blood product use, volume of crystalloid infused uh, prior to TXA, estimated blood loss, 
number of transfused uh, unit of blood product, time to, of the, uh, to emergency care, uh, hospital length of the stays, and adverse side effects. One of the big things that I'm reading from pre and post hospital setting and prior studies that has been prospective and retrospective is the fact that there are unknown issues about when the TXA is being given. Uh, prior to first liter of crystalloid or after two liter of crystalloid. Remember, TXA is not a uh, clotting factor. TXA needs uh, uh, fibrinogen uh, in order to actually make the fibrin and stabilize the fibrin. So in this scenario, uh, we will show some of that results that we are hoping to get in terms of um, the stabilizations of the um, uh, clot and use of TXA. I thank you here and I let my colleague uh, talk about the other segments of this study. Thank you. Hi, my name is Troy Pennington. I'm an emergency room physician and I'm base station medical director at Arrowhead Regional Medical Center. I also work with the San Bernardino County Fire Department in Mercy Air in Region 2 of Southern California. As a former paramedic, I'm very excited about the opportunity for TXA administration in the field. The Isma region is the first region in California to ever have approval for pre-hospital paramedic administration of TXA. Now, where did this all come from? It came from the CRASH-2 trial. There have been a lot of people looking at the TXA utilization for many, many years. But one of the best studies and that had one of the biggest data sets was the CRASH-2 trial. CRASH-2 trial started in 2005. It was a very large multi-center trial. And they basically had a hypothesis. Their hypothesis was, well, if we look at tranexamic acid, it's an antifibrinolytic. It reduces blood clot breakdown. It has been shown to reduce bleeding in surgery. Many trauma patients die from bleeding. So we're trying to see if tranexamic acid saves lives in bleeding trauma patients. So that was kind of the hypothesis behind the CRASH-2 trial. Now, when they looked at the patient enrollment, this was a big study. This study looked at 20,211 patients. 274 enrolling hospitals in over 40 countries. And when we looked at this giant data set, um, the patients were very well matched and very well controlled. This was a very uh, well done, prospective, randomized uh, study that was placebo controlled. I wanted to show you a video from the CRASH-2 trial that talks a little bit about TXA administration in the field or in the pre-hospital setting. Systolic 100. Systolic 90. Get me blood. A clot stabilizer given within three hours of injury reduces the risk of bleeding to death by 30%. Check out the CRASH-2 trial. <sighs> So I would encourage you to take a look at some of the data behind the, cash, the CRASH-2 trial. The CRASH-2 trial essentially with this big data set looked at the reduction in all-cause mortality. The reduction in the TXA group was 14.5% versus 16% mortality in the placebo group with a p-value that was statistically significant. The bleeding-related mortality was reduced down to 4.9% in the TXA group versus 57 in the placebo group and they had importantly no increase in fatal vascular occlusive events. It's important to recognize that if you think of this as an uh, antifibrinolytic. It's a medication that stabilizes the clot. So you're concerned that if we stabilize the clot that we're going to have an increased risk of thrombosis, increased risk of DVT, pulmonary embolism, or increased risk of MI. That did not bear out in this very, very large trial. There was no increased risk of thrombosis shown in this very large patient set. I have two little quick sound bites that I wanted to share with you that are both from primary investigators in the CRASH-2 trial. These are short little kind of uh, sound bites that are summaries of an interview that was taken. This interview was done by um, uh, Scott Weingart. He's a critical care and emergency medicine guru from the east coast of the United States. But it, it, this interview, he was interviewing Tim Coates, who is one of the primary investigators in CRASH-2. And I just wanted to play you the quick little summary. So how do we sum this all up? Transexamic is cheap. We're talking 
100 bucks a gram in the United States, at least at our hospital. In Great Britain, it seems like it's ridiculously cheap, something like uh, the equivalent of less than $10, and it saves lives. Now, probably the greatest benefit is seen in those who are hypotensive or really sick, but if you only gave it to those patients, according to Dr. Coates, you'd be missing out on a lot of the benefit over a much broader population. His contention, you should be giving it to any patient requiring blood transfusion and trauma. You should get that first gram in, which is over 10 minutes, as soon as possible. Uh, when you have the time, start the infusion. Uh, if you want to get the exact same situation as they had in the CRASH-2 trial, the MATTERS trial will tell us that intermittent boluses would work as well. Uh, I don't see any reason not to be giving this. There was no thrombogenic side effects in the enormous population of the CRASH-2 trial. It's not being done. It probably should be done. Uh, start doing it. Get the trauma folks, the critical care folks, the ED folks, and the hematology folks in a room and parse this out. That's what we're doing right now. Now recognize we are not going to, you know, Dr. Weingart talked about the study protocol and giving additional doses. We are not going to vary from our single dose. We're going to give one dose of TXA, the one gram, initially over 10 minutes. We are not going to do that second dose in the field. That dose is going to be at the discretion of our trauma centers. Um, the CRASH-2 data set um, revealed some very interesting things and one of the things that came to light was the fact that TXA needs to be given early and so as they started to break down the data they found that the earlier that TXA was given the better the patients did so there was a trend towards increased mortality in those patients that administered or administered TXA after the three-hour cutoff so this is a, an interview from The Lancet with Ian Roberts, who is also one of the principals in uh, the TXA study of CRASH-2. Um, and I just wanted to play this quick little interview for you here. I'm Ian Roberts, and I'm the clinical coordinator of the CRASH-2 trials at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Many thanks indeed for talking to The Lancet. If a year ago we thought within eight hours was a reasonable catch or you know relevant time frame but now we're saying within three hours there's an implication isn't it that um, quite often people will need to be given tranexamic acid outside the hospital setting so is that going to alter trauma protocols do you think i think it will the knowledge that this is a time critical intervention will actually push the administration of tranexamic acid as early as possible in countries where they've got well-developed pre-hospital care systems then it, it I think it's likely to appear in that setting. Patients will be picked up from the scene and maybe you know, tr treated with tranexamic acid in the ambulance or as soon as they arrive in hospital. Most of the effect of tranexamic acid on all-cause mortality was from death due to bleeding. That's what you would expect given the hypothesized mechanism of action of tranexamic acid. So tranexamic acid is an antifibrinolytic agent and it reduces clot breakdown. It supports the coagulation system by strengthening the, the clots that the patient's forming. Because of its mechanism, most of the effect you'd expect on death due to bleeding. And so it became reasonable to see how did the effect of tranexamic acid on death due to bleeding, the, which is a clear signal of benefit, how did that vary by time to treatment? And we found remarkably strong evidence that the effect of the treatment varied by time to treatment, such that early treatment was far and away more effective than late treatment. The importance of this second publication is to emphasize that early treatment is absolutely critical. Ideally, treatment in the first hour, which uh, patients who are treated in the first hour, there's a th more than a 30% reduction in mortality due to bleeding compared to placebo. It's a time-dependent treatment effect, and that's the main conclusion of this second paper. That was Ian Roberts in an interview with The Lancet. That was from the article, The Importance of Early TXA Administration. That was a follow-up article uh, put out by the CRASH-2 collaborators. One of the things that I'm excited uh, about in our EMS system is that in the original CRASH-2 study, it was a very large population. That study population was, again, 20,000 patients, but it was spread out in over 40 different countries and at 274 hospitals. We're going to be able to look at this study based on the standards of care in the United States in a very tightly controlled EMS system. As a former paramedic, I look forward and I'm very excited about the upcoming TXA study in the ISMA region. Thank you.
So to summarize our key points for the Riverside County EMS branch of the TXA trial study, we're starting our trial study on May 1st, 2015, and we're going to move forward for 18 months. We're looking to capture 225 patients. All of our trauma centers are participating in the study, and all of our ALS care providers who use EPCR data systems are participating. We're looking for you to follow a list of inclusion and exclusion criteria, and you can find those on the REMSA policy 5801. 5801 is going to be found on the REMSA website, and our whole goal is to improve hemorrhagic shock outcomes. And our goal with management of these patients is to identify specific patients who can benefit from the drug and exclude patients who will likely not benefit from the drug. So now let's review our inclusion criteria for TXA administration. We're going to focus on trauma patients that are 18 years of age and older that have had sustained blunt or penetrating injury, and that injury has to have occurred within three hours of your patient contact. We are going to have you make trauma-based hospital contact in all of these cases, and you may encounter patients with internal or external bleeding with TXA, and your high-risk patients could have signs and symptoms of hemorrhagic shock, they could have estimated blood loss of 500 milliliters or greater, internal or external, and you'll see that with sustained tachycardia and or hypotension. Patients that have amputations above the wrists or ankles are also high risk for hemorrhage, and you should be considering TXA in those. We'll move on to exclusion criteria next. When we're dealing with exclusion criteria, we are going to not give TXA to patients that are under 18. We're not going to give TXA to patients that have more than three hours post their injury and hour contact time. And of course, you're not going to give TXA to anybody that's allergic to it. The other thing that you need to factor in are the patient's medical history findings. We want to avoid giving TXA to anyone who's at risk for a thromboembolic event, such as a stroke, a heart attack, or a PE. There's also some specific injuries we want to avoid giving TXA in. Those include penetrating cranial injuries, patient that has a traumatic brain injury and they have exposed brain matter, so that could be your open skull fracture patients. We want to avoid giving TXA to patients that have a cervical injury and a documented motor deficit. You're also going to want to avoid giving TXA to patients that are in traumatic arrest, that you've resuscitated more than five minutes and they have no ROSC. TXA is not going to be included in that cardiac arrest algorithm. Now lastly, with exclusion criteria, if a patient has isolated hanging or drowning, they're not a candidate for TXA administration. When you're documenting your TXA administration, the description of the injury and the time of injury is very key for us in the CQI end of things. We need to make sure that the time frames are met and we need to have descriptions of how the patient was injured, isolated or multi-system. So to help you with that, we've added a flex field to Sansio that will pop up when you select TXA. It will have a few data fields in it, and that flex field will be standardized across all providers who use Sansio. And if you're in a situation where you transfer care of your patient to AMR, their trial study tab is activated in meds, and they will be able to record the same data variables that you are capturing. To aid in your documentation as well, every patient that gets TXA needs to have a neon green armband placed around their wrist so that we can track them. The armbands are numbered. You're going to be recording that armband number in your PCR as well. Now beyond the armband number and you recording that in your flex fields, we're going to have a set of data elements that we capture from both the hospital and the pre-hospital arenas. We're looking for unique identifiers to the incident, like the incident number, but we're also looking for unique identifiers to the patient, like age, gender, weight, race, and ethnicity. Now you're already going to have reviewed the patient's allergies and medical history, so those will be documented as well, along with their estimated blood loss. And we are partnering with ISMA's Institutional Review Board, so we will be adding all of our patient groups together and able to research and separate out data based upon individual patient variables. So the more patient information you collect, the better off we will be. 
with the patient's overall TXA administration, you're going to be documenting the dose, the route, and the time of administration. And while you're giving the drug, we're focusing on the patient's vital signs. TXA given too fast can cause hypotension, as you've learned in the video. So we want to make sure that we're tracking the patient's perfusion status. Now, this not only includes a full blood pressure, but also the patient's skin signs and their Glasgow coma score. So please make sure on those vital signs that you're tracking that you're filling out as many of those elements as you are able to. Now, after the patient's documentation has been submitted, we're going to be following through with the hospital and their hospital charting and CQI end. We're auditing all of the PCRs from the out-of-hospital and in-hospital settings, and we're going to be following the patient for their first two days of admission to look at complications and death rates. We're also going to be tracking their overall hospital stay and what their hospital disposition might have been. When we're wrapping up the TXA study, we'll be sharing information regarding patient outcomes, and we're looking for your field feedback as well. How did your patients do with TXA? Did it work well? Did it work poorly? We thank you for participating in the study.